So I'd like to do a recording here of a video that I've uh, created out of uh, photographs from the Marshall Islands. This is uh, a collection of photographs from a few years, uh, 2011 to 2014, uh, during which time we lived in Majuro, the capital atoll of the Marshall Islands, the Republic of the Marshall Islands. So, um, yeah, we moved to Majuro from Kwajalein Atoll and specifically Gujigu Island uh, because of the work that was available in Majuro. Uh, we worked at a high school there, uh, the largest in the nation called Marshall Islands High School. And we, uh, we arrived on the island in mid-2011 much to our surprise, we saw a whole bunch of things that we didn't really expect. For example, uh, we were able to buy food quite easily. The s there was a supermarket on our island as well as uh, across the bridge uh, on the adjacent island um, where the government building and everything else is. So anyway, that's just a little background. We... um. We were real excited to be in Maduro after having lived on what was basically an outer island. And um, it, it's kind of ironic because uh, a lot of what we saw in Maduro um, was wild um, compared to <laughs> what we had experienced on the outer island on which we lived. So we, um, we did most of our swimming and diving on, uh, well, living in Maduro as opposed to the outer island. So it's kind of funny to think about because there would have been certainly um, much to see on the outer island as well. Well, whatever the case, we uh, we certainly enjoyed ourselves when we did dive here in, in Maduro. So um, maybe I can just talk a little bit about these photos and um, kind of give you a sense of what we saw and what we thought about when we saw that those sites. And... Um, yeah, so we um, we started swimming in Majuro uh, soon after having arrived because the lagoon, um, the enclosed area surrounded by the coral atoll, uh, of which there are, I think are 29 in the Marshalls, um, was readily available to us. We were just, I think, less than a minute away from the lagoon. We could walk maybe four or five meters to the lagoon and uh, go for a swim in, in the morning or evening and um, sometimes even at night. So uh, after we arrived, we took advantage quickly of the lagoon and uh, we began swimming. Um, some of the things we saw surprised us quite a bit. We didn't expect to see such animals uh, and also we didn't we didn't even expect to really have a place to swim because like I said, we on the island of Gujigu, there was plenty available to us. We just we were too preoccupied or whatnot to uh, enjoy the underwater scenery. Plus, we weren't really there uh, for that long, just six months together. So um, Maduro, though, was three years, and we were able to you know, afford um, equipment for swimming and underwater cameras and things like that. So... That's where these pictures have been taken from. All of them are from Majuro Atoll. So yeah, we um, we quickly realized that there was going to be a lot to eat from the lagoon. So we bought ourselves a spear gun, well, rather a uh, rubber banded spear gun uh, for shooting at fish and things. And um, I was able to get fish right away, uh, although they weren't very big. They were still edible, so... We would sometimes ask people for their advice on whether or not we could eat a fish. Of course, we knew certain fish were not edible, such as puffer fish. But, um, yeah, we uh, we quickly started catching fish with the spear. And uh, we also discovered octopus. And so one of our first uh, major adventures underwater was to catch our first octopus. And for that, we... Um, affixed a knife to the end of a long stick pole that was next to our house and uh, tied it on with like a, an old shoelace and kind of used nails to kind of 
hold it in place and things like that. It was kind of silly in retrospect because the octopus, although not not small, were certainly not a danger to us. <laughs> so I think I was a little over prepared for that. But uh, we went out on uh, I think a, was it a weekday I think, and it was after school I think, and it was quite wavy. Uh, waves were crashing against our bodies as we swam out to the place where the octopus lived. We'd seen it there before, and uh, Ami took a video of it while I went down and tried to get it out. And I was able to get it, and we cooked it up and ate it. It was delicious. Um, and that became a sort of habit. We began to catch octopus whenever we saw them. And um, we also started collecting different kinds of food, such as shells, truncheon shells, for example, conical-shaped, reddish-colored um, shells. And we, uh, we made use of those as well, uh, not only for eating, but also for decoration. And a funny thing about that is that um, through all of our, uh, our consumption, we soon realized that uh, we were actually decimating the, the population of wildlife of certain species out in the lagoon, for example, with uh, octopus, we were um, we didn't see as many octopus after say uh, a year or two as we did before, and um, they would keep coming back, but we just they didn't come back in in full force. Maybe they're back again now, but uh, it was it was quite a realization for me because uh, I mean it's obvious to to anybody who thinks about it that um you know when you take away from a population you're going to decrease that population but um yeah i didn't i never saw my impact on an on an ecosystem until we started taking food from the lagoon but um so we we began to conserve a bit more after especially after the truncheon shells uh we would at first we were getting maybe 10, 15 every time we went out, and that went on for a month or two, but then uh, we decimated the population, and, and there was uh, very little left after that. So we learned to cut back after the octopus and truncheon shell population decreased, and we realized it. So uh, that was a good thing, I guess, and also maybe not so good <laughs> in another sense, but live and learn, right? Um, we saw puffer fish. And uh, you'll see those in the pictures here. And, and I uh, I know that they're not edible. And, of course, in Japan, they're known as fugu. And they're famous for uh, being a somewhat dangerous food to eat if it's not prepared by a professional uh, certified chef. But we saw them, and uh, I even took a picture into one of the uh, – one of the people at the school, one of the Marshallese guys who worked in the counseling office as a counselor, and I showed him the picture of a large puffer fish because they didn't move, you know, they didn't, they didn't fear at all because I think they are not aware, but perhaps they know that they are not going to be eaten. Animals just don't touch them. And, uh, <laughs> the guy told me, uh, yeah, you can't, can't eat that. I wasn't too surprised. We also saw a large anemone that was there for the whole three years that we were there. It was out in, at low tide, probably two meters of water, and uh, it was a large one, kind of bulbous mass of gelatin-like uh, organic structure with uh, tentacles on the top of it, and a little fish flowing all around it. So um, I wouldn't go beyond the depths, uh, like the shallows of the lagoon. There was a drop-off um, some meters away from the shore, and I wouldn't go beyond that because it wasn't uh, safe. It didn't feel safe at all. So I just wouldn't do it. But um, beyond that drop-off point, I could often see larger fish such as tuna and um, what are they called? Sunfish, I suppose. The kind of flat-bodied, roundish-shaped fish um, that swim as other fish do, but just really wide and circular in, in body type. And uh, I always wanted to catch them. I always tried to get close enough to get those guys, but I was never able to... Uh, to really do it, unfortunately. Another thing we saw a lot of were um, eels. Every time we went out, uh, almost every time, there was an eel sticking its head out of a crevice in the coral rocks or in the sand and the earth. 
and um, these guys were a bit a bit frightening actually. Uh, I heard stories. One uh, student of mine um, told me a story about his uncle, who um, at the end of uh, the stretch main stretch of islands on on Majuro, a place called Laura, um, some years ago, was out there spearfishing and he came across a an, an eel that was quite large i think he was larger than the the man himself who was f- spearfishing and um the guy you know caught the eel he he killed the eel because of the danger that the eel posed apparently that there is some some danger involved the, their teeth are are uh, are angled in a backwards direction so if you get caught by them uh they can really hang on like a like a badger <laughs> i i don't know uh from personal experience uh since i've never been bit or anything like that but they certainly don't have a kind looking appearance <laughs> as animals you see them sticking their heads out of rocks and they just look kind of mean it's probably the angle of their eyes and all that but yeah they look like they got sharp teeth and uh like they could do some damage to you and i know that they catch uh octopus they eat octopus and if they can get their teeth around the uh, legs uh, around of an octopus they can they can bite off a leg and so you'll often see a lot of the octopus we caught were missing legs um, let's see about the shellfish we took back to our place a whole bunch of different shells um, and some of them I, I still don't really know what they were we never caught uh, we never picked up giant clams because there just weren't any those are more of an outer island thing. But, um, yeah, like smaller shells, for example, what we might see in the Pacific Northwest, those kinds of uh, clams, uh, we would get a couple of those every once in a while if you could, if you were lucky, if they were sitting on the surface because I wasn't about to dig. Um, also, scallops of various kinds um, and oysters, too. There were different species that... Uh, we just don't have in uh, the United States, maybe Hawaii or Guam, but not in the continental United States that are just um, really have beautiful sort of appearance. Like if you see them, they've got these r- sort of ripples in between the two sh- shells and uh, sometimes eyes sticking out. And uh, I would just grab them if I could because, you know, I wanted to try them and I'd, I'd ask if I needed to, but... It was basically the whole area was um, protected by a local chief, or um, yeah, he was he was a chief, and he protected the area, and he made sure that uh, people stayed off the land, and the the Marshallese people knew too, according to the customs, that you know it wasn't a place that you could visit without permission. So he he gave me uh, express permission to do my own fishing there. And he was sometimes driving in when I was coming out of the water and he'd see me with an octopus or fish or whatnot. And he'd express, uh, you know, pleasure at having had seen me, you know, follow some some of the Marshallese tradition. Regarding the Marshallese tradition, there was a technique that I used sometimes when I went out, which is a use of uh, a line that was traditionally made out of coconut fiber. And I, I don't know, this is probably used in other but maybe the states too, where spear fishing is done, where people hook a line around their belt and string fish onto the line through the mouths or through the eye sockets to keep the fish on. Uh, the danger, though, is of course sharks. But since we were in a kind of shallow and protected area, not too wild, it was uh, it was not too big of a problem. So anyway, he um, he kind of protected the area and. Uh, and since I, you know, since uh, Ami and I lived there, we were able to, you know, use the areas freely, basically as we wanted. So we were the only ones who really swam there, and we got plenty of stuff because of that. So one of the places we visited was a place close to the airport, and the airport—it's an international airport named after the first president, Amata Kabua. It's called the Amata Kabua International Airport, and it's just an airstrip, basically, since there's no real um, land on which to build other facilities. 
And um, we went swimming uh, in 2012 and 13 at a location that was just uh, just beyond the airport toward Laura. And uh, it was interesting because the whole area was, I think it had been dug out and maybe blasted by dynamite. Um, and we went with our little, we bought a rubber boat for, you know, 20 bucks or whatever. And we went out to that area and, uh, Ami sat in the rubber raft and I swam down below. And this area was unique because there were a bunch of urchins and these long kind of, uh, look like tapeworms. What, what are they called? I'm not sure, but, uh, there's pictures of them here. And, um, it was just cool to see urchins like sitting out in the open like that. We'd seen them on Gujigu, but never, uh, never in an environment such as this. So anyway, uh, they ended up taking that area out. I think uh, filling it in or something for use of the land. I think, and so now in 2017, there um, I don't think you can see that place anymore. But yeah, we'd park the car just next to the road, go out there and have some fun. The Marshalls is just strips of land. It's, I mean, Majuro has the longest road in the country, which is probably about 30 miles long, I think. And uh, it's interesting because it's the longest road in the nation, basically. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, 30 miles long. And that's that's a long road if you think about the structure of the land and everything. But, um, yeah, we'd just park our car and go in there and, you know, swim around or whatever. Um so uh, most of these pictures are from in front of our place and uh, you know we just lived a few meters from the beach and we could just walk there and go anytime we wanted swimming and uh one of the things that i enjoyed doing was uh looking in this one particular area it was next to a large table coral and there was uh from time to time there would be a peacock flounder and peacock flounders are so named because of their peacock like spots on their bodies and so I would uh, approach that area slowly, kind of from an angle, uh, from the side of the table coral so that I wouldn't be spotted. And uh, I'd try to sneak up in case there was a peacock flounder there. I could, you know, grab him. I could spear him. And I often did. And so we'd, I think on one occasion I got two. And uh, so we'd have a uh, flounder once a month or so from that one sandy area. And it became kind of a, a tradition almost like the octopus the shells the small fish that I got with the spear and those flounder that became kind of a, a small part of our diet of course we had supermarkets and all that but it was enjoyable to be able to catch our own food something I'd always wanted to do but I don't want to hunt deer or anything like that so this was a good way to experience that kind of culture um Let's see, we went at night sometimes, and I don't know if Ami ever went with me, but I, I went a few times, well, I went a dozen or so times probably, and uh, I got to tell you, like, when, when I was out there at night uh, all by myself, uh, I, had, I had Ami stand on the beach in case <laughs> anything happened. I mean, I don't know so much about uh, the environment in terms of that area, so I wasn't sure what the danger was. Uh, in terms of sharks or other poisonous animals like that. But I did go out, and uh, we bought a flashlight, Toshiba brand, uh, Japanese-made underwater flashlight, and it was it had a weight inside of it and a very powerful beam to cut through the the water and all that, good, good for salt water. And um, I would go down, turn on the light, start... Swim, swimming and um <coughs> excuse me and um yeah the light only penetrated so far you know even though the water is tropical and it's a coral atoll a lagoon it would still since it was night it would only cut so far through the water and i gotta tell you it was it was kind of a freaky experience i tried not to go too far from shore and keep the water just a couple meters but you could hear sounds from time to time, a fish moving away or whatever, and uh, you just turn your light real quick and you'd catch the eye of a, you know, maybe a six-inch fish or something, and it, it's just kind of freaky. 
went out one time, actually saw a shark at night, was swimming with a friend who wore glasses. So he, when he put on the face mask, um, he had to take off the glasses. So he wasn't uh, so aware of the environment, you know, because he wasn't wearing his glasses. And we were out there swimming and I saw a shark in front of us uh, shine my light straight ahead at something, saw just kind of a gray wall. And I'm not talking like a great white shark or nothing like that. No, I just, uh, it was a, a gray figure in the water and I saw it move. <laughs> it's a shark and move the light toward the face. And there's, there's a shark and it was six feet long, not too thick in body, but still not something you want to see when you're out swimming at night. So, um, I, the, the shark moved away. It didn't, was not aggressive toward us, which is fortunate. And, uh, I tapped my friend and we went above water for a moment. And I said, didn't you, did you see that shark? He said, no, nah, I didn't see anything. <laughs> he couldn't see anything cause he wasn't wearing his glasses. So maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> um, but we were, you know, we never had, there was never any danger. I think the, the biggest danger was perhaps, uh, jellyfish when they spawned i think it was jellyfish eggs that would float in the water and it would just be hundreds and hundreds thousands maybe of eggs just floating all around us in these kind of gelatin like uh sacks that hung down from the surface of the water and uh i i don't i'm not fully aware of how these animals reproduce but it seems to be a an orgy of eggs and sperm all in the water there. And <laughs> we'd swim through that. Uh, I think maybe it's once a year, but I, I remember it a couple times. And uh, I remember being out there and Ami was with me and uh, she has less hair on her skin. So she was getting more of the pain than I was. She, she started tapping me frantically, you know, we got to get out of here. And I, and then I was like, what, what is it? And then I realized we're surrounded by these eggs and it starting to hurt a lot on our skin and they were they had stinging uh, tentacles or you know whatever you know cells sting cells and we were getting hurt so we we went back in and we were careful not to swim when there were jellyfish eggs in the water so yeah we um we got to experience some of the you know tropical things that do occur in lagoon waters such as this but for the most part, it wasn't like it wasn't like you know the pictures you see of the underwater tropical scenes in Hawaii or or whatever. It was it was a kind of controlled environment. I like to think it was a little bit bit of a a bay area. It was protected, an alcove you could say, and um, like the water was quite shallow up until a certain point, at which I mentioned that just dropped off into the dark water at a deeper level but yeah there wasn't really any any dangerous stuff out there so we did go one time uh we liked a vacation at a hotel that was uh about 15 20 minutes from our place uh along the same road and on the same in the same atoll and uh it was called long island hotel it's since closed down but uh it was a really nice hotel i think it was chinese run maybe but all Marshallese uh, employment, with the exception of the restaurant staff, which was a Chinese restaurant um, at the hotel. And we would go out swimming sometimes. One time we went out when it was raining, and it was a kind of misty rain, which is not so common. Usually it's a, a heavier rain. And it was a just a, a light rain is what I mean. And it was falling, and we go out. So we get the kind of warmer water down below on our bodies, on our undersides as we were snorkeling and then this kind of cool rain on our backs it was it was a pleasant experience and we're uh we're looking down below us at all these animals and there are some pictures here and you might be able to differentiate them from the uh, pictures from in front of our house but uh, because these these pictures are much more vibrant the environment was just vibrant and just teeming with life in a way that I'd never 
seen in my whole life. I mean, I've seen obviously forest uh, environments, ecosystems, and all that, and you'll see a whole bunch of animals and all that. But a coral environment is is it's like a condensed area, and because you're getting kind of an aerial view of it, looking down as we do when we're snorkeling upon it, it was it was a an experience all in its own, and uh, I couldn't believe it. Like, for example, you get this, uh, what is that called again, uh, the branching coral that comes up like trees, and there would be a whole colony of that that stretch for maybe two meters from, you know, two meters by two meters, and then you get all these fish swimming in and out of these long stalks of coral, and then next to that you get a whole group of table coral that wasn't just one level, it was layered like a, like a wedding cake or like a fancy platter, and uh, and in, uh, in all of this, you know, just the environment, the blue-green water and the s sand below, you'd get all these animals, puffer fish and squid and fish of all different kinds, and that, that was a uh, really incredible experience at that hotel. And uh, it's sad that they've closed down, but I'm glad we got a chance to go there. Never did take uh, underwater video, but did take uh, pictures. Uh, another place we went, and uh, this is not something for anybody to do, but we didn't know better, I guess, and we took a risk. We went to the ocean side uh, on some, I think what is private land uh, near the bridge, and you're not supposed to do that, I think, but we did it, man. Uh, when we when we went there, there there's some areas that have been blasted by by uh, dynamite uh, for use along the the side of the road to maybe protect from water crashing a, along the shore, and so these dynamited holes were just incredibly deep. Like I couldn't even see the bottom of one of them. It was that deep. The water was that dark, and the light just didn't penetrate down that deep. Uh, it almost looked like the drop-off point, like in front of the place that we lived at. And uh, went out there one time and quickly realized uh, that this is not a good place to swim because entered the water, immediately saw that the what what looks like a, a simple pool of water from the outside was in fact this deep pit, and uh, I didn't know what was in there. And I didn't know what would get me, <laughs> if anything. I'm not a paranoid swimmer when it comes to these things, but, you know, I'm not inexperienced. Or in other words, you know, I swam plenty in the lagoon around our house and in other areas. And But this place, uh, we got down there. Well, I went by myself, which is probably a good thing. And um, it just it just didn't feel safe. It felt like something was waiting in the in the depths. And, uh, yeah, so just got out and <laughs> didn't do that again. So, um, what else? There was a large rock at the edge of the lagoon, um, or rather the shallow area of the lagoon in front of our house. And, uh, this large rock, it was a coral rock, like every rock in the Marshalls, and, um, it had a whole bunch of little blue fish swimming all around the top of it. And uh, I sometimes would swim over the top of it and look down the other side. And since it was situated just on the lip of the drop-off point, uh, I didn't go further than that. But I, there was a large clam shell, or not a clam, but rather maybe a, a scallop of some kind, I think. And uh, it had jagged teeth you know, edge to the front of the shell. And then the shell would be open sometimes for breathing or feeding or whatever it was doing. And um, when my parents visited, I swam down and got it. And um, I think there's a, I think I may have put a video on YouTube. And it was just really cool because, uh, first of all, it was a really deep place for me to dive. I'm not a good diver. I've always had some problems with my ears, um, you know, sensitive ears, and so I, I don't feel comfortable diving too deep. But this, um, this one was, you know, not too deep. It was maybe 
15 feet, I would say, when at high tide. So low tide could be as low as 10 feet. And uh, my dad and I went out there together, and um, I had been saving it for such an occasion, that such as my folks visiting, and glad I did. I dove down and got it, brought it up, and out of water it made avoided as much as 10 pounds. Brought it up on shore and opened it up and got the meat out and ate it. It was pretty pretty tasty. Uh, some other things that we tried that probably aren't even legal in the States is uh, conch shell. And um, we really didn't know what we were doing uh, at first. And we didn't have, a, as anthropologists would call it, a key informant. It was nobody to... Um, advise us on a regular basis um, we had friends and things like that but they weren't readily available to us uh, so I couldn't really ask you know before or like when at, at a time at which I needed advice uh, for advice but we we did just take risks sometimes and we did take a conch shell out and we didn't know how to get to the meat and uh, so we we made the mistake of trying to break it open, which just was silly and kind of a waste of a beautiful animal and shell. Uh, well, we ate it, and it was it was good. And uh, I decided I want to learn the right way because I know people used to eat that traditionally, and I want to I want to try it. So we go out again, and we get another one. There were maybe five or six of them out in our our area. Brought it back, and this time I'd gotten advice from the the local chief, and he told us that uh, we can attach a fish hook to the meat of the snail part, and then attach a weight to the hook, and then it will slowly be pulled out. At which time we don't have to break the shell, and we can eat the meat. So we did that, and we got it out without any problem. And uh, it's kind of a interesting interesting idea for getting things out. I wondered about the uh, health of the coral because some of it was not so healthy looking. But, um, I mean, it, overall it was like a, it was a real ecosystem. It was fully supported by the animals and plants that lived in the area. And it was just cool to see it, you know, to see how a miniature environment like that can hold such an abundance of life. And that's not even, you know, an outer island in the marshes. That's the capital city. So um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I just wanted to share some of these pictures with you. There were, I think, 350 here, which is a lot of pictures. But, um, yeah, I thought I'd, I wanted to just share this and uh, hope you enjoyed it. And uh, if you got any questions, comments, or anything, don't hesitate to, you know, put them on the video type whatever you want. So there it is. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.